Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Um, I really appreciate everyone being here uh, on this beautiful fall day, so thanks for taking some time to spend with us. Um, I'm Carrie Bourne. I'm from the Office of Continuing Education at UW-Whitewater. Um, we have been hosting the lecture series here at Fairhaven Senior Services for 39 years. This is our 39th season. <laughs> yeah, and so I've done it every time. Yes, you have. <laughs> Yeah, we're so happy to be here. Fairhaven is such a great partner to the university, and, and so um, we're really happy to be here and to be back after a couple years of being gone. So um, this semester, we are gonna focus on a theme like we do every semester. This semester, we're gonna rediscover Wisconsin, so we're gonna talk about some people and places and groups and events from Wisconsin, and we'll have um, lectures through right through November. Um, Today we'll have a, a talk about a Wisconsin author, and then we'll save some time at the end for Q&A. Um, and if you do have a question at the end, we'll use this microphone to go around so that everybody in the room can hear us. Um, but enough of me talking, let's get right down to the presentation. Um, John Pruitt has been teaching English at UW-Whitewater at Rock County since 2004. Although he's not a native of Wisconsin, he finds ways to introduce obscure to introduce obscure Wisconsin authors to his students and the general public as part of their own cultural history. Otherwise, he's just a Southern guy still trying to figure out why people from Wisconsin speak so strangely. Please welcome John Pruitt. And some of you have heard me say this before, y'all talk funny. <laughs> All y'all. All y'all, yep. <laughs> y'all heard of this guy? What, what do you know? Okay. Here and there, right? Is, is that really him? That's him. It is, I promise. <laughs> We're going to talk about August Ehrlich, but not the August Ehrlich that you know. All right? Hey, John. I know John. Oh, you don't want to read the... Oh, you're reading the poem, right? Can you see it okay? Yep. With feeling. The new cow came through the gate, and her calf came after, a little late. No longer willing to be led, the calf went on ahead. While she stood to look around over the hills and lower ground, stood shyly, defiantly there, smelling flower fragrant air, and gazed. Round of applause. Well done. Isn't this a nice poem? Do you like it? Yeah. yeah. Cows. <laughs> Welcoming the new cow in, right? This ain't the August Earlith we're going to be talking about today. This is the August Earlith we're going to be talking about today. <laughs> Not what you're expecting. That's how I like it. Okay, but what we're gonna do first is talk about how he got from the cow to this, okay? So, just some bio. He grew up in Sauk City. You all know Sauk City? I have not been there yet. Should I go? What am I gonna find there? Anything interesting? Good bike trail. Bike trail, okay. All these things? Oh, all these things. Do I have to be outdoorsy? No. I'm not outdoorsy. <laughs> I don't want to be. Um, so he, 1909, when he was born, he grew up here, Sauk City, educated at a local parochial school, and then he went to the public high school, and he began writing when he was about 13. And finally, he wrote this vampire story called Bat's Belfry, and it was published in a magazine called Weird Tales. This is when he was 17. So he's now finally published, he's writing stories, and then he went to UW-Madison. Okay. Personal life, not very much. 
Okay. He, um, there's really not much to tell. In 1953, he married Sandra Evelyn Winters. They divorced six years later. He retained custody of their two kids, April Rose and uh, Walden William. And that's the end of the story. Okay. So, yeah, she's just... I couldn't even find a picture of her. I looked for a picture, nothing to be found. Maybe she didn't exist either. I don't know. No idea. But Durleth was outdoorsy, unlike me. Okay. Um, so as an adult, he taught American regional literature um, at UW, and he organized a rangers club for young people, and he served as a parole officer, maybe fitting for young people, perhaps, um, and he was contributing editor of um, a magazine called Outdoors, and he became the literary editor of the Capital Times, and then he began editing and publishing a magazine called Hawk and Whippoorwill. Um, which was dedicated to poems about nature, okay? We're not quite to those pictures yet, though, right? Okay. And then there is this something called the Sock Prairie Saga. You know, that one. Okay. Um, expansive series of novels, right? Uh, short stories, journals, poems, nonfiction. And it was all about Sock Prairie, whose, whose prototype is Sock City. And he intended this series to comprise like 50 or so novels telling the projected life story of this area. Okay. Um, starting in the 19th century, I believe. So very much a regional writer. And this is what made him well known among regional literary figures of the time, especially these two Wisconsin authors. Oh, I'm skewed. My names are skewed a little bit there. Um, you know Hamlin Garland? Do you? <laughs> Wisconsin author, regional. Um, I think he's best known for a series of novels known as the Middle Border series. Okay, and then Zona Gale, um, best known for her short novel, Miss Lulu Bet, which became a play. She won a Pulitzer Prize for it, and she's since been a little bit forgotten. Okay, I like her hair. Do we need to bring that back? Yeah? <laughs> Did any of you have hair like that? I want to know that you that you did. <laughs> I just we need to bring it back. <laughs> okay. Now, so as a result of his early work on the Sock Prairie Saga, he got a Guggenheim Fellowship, very prestigious, and these were his sponsors. And again, I'm oh, my stuff is all skewed. I'm sorry about that. So Helen White on the left, she was um, an English professor at Madison. And she was the chair of the English department a couple times. She's the first woman to achieve full professor in the College of Arts and Letters and Sciences at Madison. Okay. And then a couple famous authors here. Um, you know St. Clair Lewis. What did he write? Main Street. What else? His other famous book, Babbitt. You know that one? Yep. And then Edgar Lee Masters. Anybody? Um, he wrote the uh, Spoon River Anthology, a series of poems. Okay. Um, good regional writers from the area. They, um, he got their attention, Durlift did, and they sponsored him. Okay. But then how do we get from this to that? Isn't that great evening in spring? Look at that. It looks like just romantic under a tree. There's some river or other flowing there. I don't know, then that, weird frog people. So the Mask of Cthulhu, tales of terror and horror grown from mankind's ageless struggle between good and evil. Hmm, a science fiction horror book, it says. Huh, okay. So let's talk about some other kinds of books that he wrote instead of the regionalist approach, okay. So one series is called Solar Ponds, and this was about 70 short stories. Who's that guy look like on the left? Sherlock he loved Sherlock Holmes. Loved him. And, uh, and the author, Arthur Conan Doyle. And it, so in 1946, um, in the middle of, of Durlith writing all these, these stories and novels with this character, um, Conan Doyle's two sons made attempts to force Durlith to stop because of copyright, but the efforts were unsuccessful. 
So they just withdrew it, and Duralith kind of thumbed his nose at them and kept writing. Plagiarism, what do you think? Or is it just like a fan fiction? It looks just like Sherlock Holmes and Watson. You do with that as you want to, but you know the courts looked at Conan Doyle's sons and went, nah, he can do what he wants. I wonder how that would go over now. Uh -oh. Is that for a character? Oh, yeah, definitely. Okay, then we got this. So he wrote detective and mystery stories as well. And this is a 10 volume series called the Mill Creek Irregulars. Uh, young adult mystery novels, they were set in Sauk Prairie in the 1920s, so they're often considered part of that saga. Okay. Um, and you can tell some inspiration. One of them even has a, a, a raft trip down the Wisconsin River. It's similar to what you'd find in a Mark Twain novel, right? They also remind me of two of my favorites growing up, the Hardy Boys, and then Alfred Hitchcock and the Three Investigators. Did you know them? I read, I was uh, elementary school or so when I was reading them. Very similar, okay. But I, 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 I like these, you know, young adult detective stories. They're a lot of fun. And at the end, it usually comes down to two possible suspects and you can never pick out which one it is. And, and then you feel really good about yourself if you do, you know, when you're, you know, when you're a kid, right? Okay. And then, um, these mystery detective um, novels included another series um, set in Sock Prairie as well. Um, the main character was Judge Peck. Um, so uh, just also mysteries just with a different protagonist. Okay. Looks kind of weird. He's, kinda, he's getting there. Definitely getting there. Okay. And then the important stuff for especially how he got to that next step is his friendship with H.P. Lovecraft. Does he not look like Mark Zuckerberg? <laughs> what do you think? Yeah. Same person, I'm convinced. Lovecraft is still alive. And he's now Mark Zuckerberg, founder of Facebook. <laughs> They were good friends, they were correspondents. The, uh, what I find interesting is I could not find a picture of them together. Um, I don't wanna say that's weird, but I just thought it was, uh, I wasn't expecting that, I was expecting to find something with them together, but no, we just, with Zuckerberg instead. Now, um, I wanna talk to you about Lovecraft first because Durleth got a lot of inspiration from his stories and continued what Lovecraft, um, when Lovecraft died, Durleth kind of continued. Okay, so Lovecraft invented a mythology called Yog, I never get this right, Sothothery, Yog Sothothery, say it with me, Yog Sothothery. <laughs> say that 10 times real fast. Okay, um, this was an entire mythology that Lovecraft created. It was, um, and the theme, throughout all of these stories and short novels was the complete irrelevance of humankind in the face of these cosmic horrors that he called the great old ones, in air quotes. They were ancient, they're very powerful deities who came from space, and then they eventually just fell into a very, very deep sleep. And then in these these stories and these novels, some stupid person goes looking for them and they rise up again and then you have to do something about it. Okay, to see the, how big these characters are, this is a person right there on the beach and that is Cthulhu. Okay, just to give you an idea <laughs> of how big these things are. Where you can hide one, I have no idea. I don't know where you hide something that big. Um, now, these, these, these deities, they were present in almost all of Lovecraft's published work. Um, but the first story to really expand on it is, um, was the uh, story called The Call of Cthulhu, and that was published in uh, 1928. Which one's your favorite? Which one would you be least afraid of? The one on the right, you think? Okay, huh. I think there was inspiration for the Kraken from, or, or vice versa, there was either way, yeah. But, oh yeah, they all live under the ocean too, I think, if I remember right. 
Okay. Now, I want to share with you a description of Cthulhu. Okay. That's written from one of the stories. Could, would, oh, would you read this one too, please? A monster of vaguely anthropoid outline, but with an octopus-like head whose face was a mass of feelers, a scaly, rubbery-looking body, prodigious claws on hind and forefeet, and long, narrow wings behind. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Isn't that great? You ever meet anybody who looks like that? <laughs> I think I, I think I dated that person once, maybe. I don't know. But um, from Lovecraft's collection, um, a drawing that he did of, of Cthulhu. Doesn't look as scary there, but you know, hmm. He's got things coming out of his face. Yeah. Um, now let me give you some context for where this idea from Lovecraft came from, okay? Do you recognize this guy on the left? Every one of you knows who it is. Okay, so one of the, the motifs is the main character's minds tend to deteriorate when they get even a glimpse of what exists outside of their perceived reality. Okay, and this idea captured the zeitgeist of the 20s because this is a decade when Albert Einstein didn't recognize him. It's hard because we know the big, big white hair, yeah. all that. Yeah, I, I would never have known, right? Um, but he proved in the 20s that, that common sense is kind of wrong, I guess, and that the universe has, is a whole lot stranger or more cosmic than we could imagine. Yeah, and so Lovecraft was attracted to this line of thinking. So he created all of these, these gods that warped the reality around them. It just goes with Einstein's thinking. And um, his story that I have here on the right, The Horror in the Museum, it's about this mirror that was, that was created by a, <laughs> here, bear, here, bear with me, a mirror created by a sorcerer who was conducting investigations into the fourth dimension. You follow? Oh, I'm like, that's not me, is it? Okay. Within this mirror, you cannot age, and your consciousness goes on virtually forever as long as the, as the mirror stays intact. Okay? Fourth dimension, is that one time? I can't remember. S something like, is it time? Okay. Google <laughs> it. But you know, that's something that Einstein toyed with as well, right? Was, you know, was, was time, the relativity, yeah. Now, when Lovecraft died, oh, I did have a picture of them. I was wrong. There they are. Well, they're not the same person. Do you like that picture? I kind of like it. There's something really cool about it. Um, when Lovecraft died, though, in 1937, Durlith and this guy named Donald Wandry assembled a collection of his stories and tried to get them published. And they didn't have any luck because existing publishers really showed little interest. So they founded a publishing house. It's called the Arkham House. And it's still in, um, uh, what's it called? Um, Sock City. Okay, then this was 1939. And the name Arkham House comes from this. Okay, it, um, this is a fictional town of Arkham, Massachusetts that Lovecraft created. And it's featured in many of his stories. And this is a map of the town that he drew. Okay, looks like, there's a main street. Does it look like Whitewater? <laughs> Maybe it's Whitewater. It looks like there's a lot of high streets on there. Anyway, okay. Regardless, regardless. Um, so finally, in 1939 then, Arkham House published um, The Outsider and Others, which was a huge collection that contained most of Lovecraft's stories. Okay. And then the two, Durlith and Wandry, expanded Arkham House, and they began um, a regular publishing schedule after their second book came out, which was Someone in the Dark, which was a collection of some of Durlith's own stories, um, and this was published in 1941. 
I'd like to know who drew these covers, though. That's something that I haven't found out yet, is who actually illustrated this, because I, they're, you like, you like the drawings? I, I like them, too. There's, it's just the, the, the detail, the, you know, the attention to detail, I think is really interesting there. Okay. Now, Lovecraft didn't stop with Durlith. Okay, there are others involved as well. Um, others in the circle, um, including Durlith, continued to work with the same mythology. They did some revising. It was, I, I think of it as fan fiction now. Um, they wrote stories based on like fragments and notes that were left behind by Lovecraft. So he didn't completely write the stories, left some notes behind, and then they took it from there. Okay, and these were published in a collection called Weird Tales and later in book form under the byline H.P. Lovecraft and August Durlith, so still giving Lovecraft the credit, the main credit. Um, Durlith called himself a posthumous collaborator. I respect that, I guess. If it's from Lovecraft's notes and he didn't just cross out Lovecraft's name and write his own in, I'm, I'm okay with that, right? Um, but this practice raised some objections in some quarters that Durlith simply used Lovecraft's name um, to market what was essentially his own fiction. Okay. Do you like this one? Oh, wait, do you like these pictures? <laughs> Can I get some ends, maybe? There's a, I don't know if I have, there's a weird one on here of a, of a, of a melting face. It's kind of interesting, but anyway, regardless. Here we go. Look at this one. Do you like these? What do you think? Okay. I want to tell you a big difference, though, between Lovecraft and Durlith right now, is that Lovecraft was an atheist, a card-carrying atheist. And he considered his mythology as amoral. There were just, morals were not involved at all. Okay. Durlith is credited with introducing some themes of Christian hope and development in the mythology. So that was one of the significant revisions. Okay. Um, that the, the mythology really represented a struggle between, between good and evil. Okay. Um, Durlith was also more optimistic than Lovecraft was in his conception of this mythology. Um, but I think we're dealing more in, in degree and not really in kind. I, that, that, that's, that's my own suspicion there. Um, I mean, there are tales where Durlith's protagonists don't go insane. Lovecraft's protagonists, they went nuts, all of them, went completely insane. But in this one, The Witch's Hollow, for example, the protagonist does not go insane, um, but often the hero is just completely doomed, as in, um, this is called The House in the Valley. Um, yeah, just complete, just the hero was doomed, which is what happens in Lovecraft stories. Um, Durlith then added to the mythology by, by, by show him, he showed this conflict between good and evil by creating another group of gods. So we had the great old ones first, but then Durlith created the elder gods. And these were, they were benign. Okay, so they were benign deities that they, they exist peacefully. They very rarely um, move forward and intervene in the struggle between humans and the great old ones. Okay, um, because the great old ones wanted to just completely enslave the human race. Okay, um, occasionally though, a human's going to intentionally or unintentionally summon one of these, of the, um, the elder gods. Um, maybe simply encounter one, either way, benign. Doesn't look it so much. You like him? Cthulhu, it looks like. Hmm. Um, the, but these elder gods were based on like air, earth, fire, and water, just the basic elements of that. But like I said, um, benign. Let's read a description of Cthulhu here, who is the fire element. I didn't know there'd be so much reading, I couldn't remember, but would you, could you tackle this one? With feeling, it's scary. Deep within that fiery 
same monster that roared and in insatiable anger against the chains of the elder gods, which had bound it there for an eternity. Unable to resist, utterly powerless to control his movements, he was diving headlong towards that gravity, 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 chaos. Cause it's weird, Kathuga. Yeah, that's Lovecraft. That's not me. That's Kathuga. Round of applause again for our reader. You're getting lots of applause. Still scary? Yeah. You think so? Why? What's so scary? You just can't tell what it is. Yeah, it is. It is hard. I don't know. I picture it like I don't know. It looks like like head. Here, mouth, nostrils, wings, fire either, fire, either way, lots of fire, right? Just don't want to deal with that. So this is, I think, how Durlith um, added to what Lovecraft had already done. So it didn't change it really, um, revised a little bit in his own contributions to the mythology, okay? Um, but, you know, regardless of these debates of whether or not Durlith stole from Lovecraft or not, um, his founding of Arkham House, the publisher, and his efforts to rescue Lovecraft from obscurity, because he did, um, it's widely acknowledged by practitioners in the horror field as, as seminal events. So for example, Arkham House, do you know this guy on the left, even though his name's on the book on the right? That's Ray Bradbury? What do you know him from? What did he write besides Dark Carnival? He did write Dandelion Wine. What else? You know this. Do you know something wicked this way comes? Do you know Fahrenheit 451? Oh, yeah. you, you better, okay. English teacher here, you better. Not a Wisconsin guy, but either way, it doesn't matter. Um, but, they, um, but Arkham House published Bradbury's first novel, Dark Carnival, here, and this was 1947. Okay. Now, when Durlith died, um, this is his daughter, April. And she became the majority stockholder and president and CEO of Arkham House. This was 1994. Uh, she remained in that capacity until she died. Um, she was known in, in the community as a naturalist and as a humanitarian. She was a good person. Okay. Um, she died in 2011, in March of 2011. And the current owners, and this is as far as I know, um, are her children, Danielle and Damon. And they manage the business themselves and have made progress. Apparently, the um, publisher acquired a huge debt. And they, and they worked on, on paying it off. And then they signed an agreement in April of 2017 with this author, whose name is David Markham, to produce a new Solar Ponds adventure series. So that Sherlock Holmes kind of knockoff, right? Um, it wasn't, it's not to be published by Arkham House, I understand, um, but it's possibly a sign of activity to come from that publishing house. So hopefully it's, it's gonna get back going. Um, it, it might be a sign also that they're going to close the publishing house. I've not heard that. Have any, anybody, I don't know. I haven't looked into it at all. And I'm sure COVID threw a wrench into everything like it threw a wrench into everything else, right? Um, but that, that's as far as I know, okay. Um, and I think, back to Durlith here, that I, I, I like the idea of, of him trying to recover Lovecraft. And then as we continue reading, um, his other works, I think it's I think it's important to bring his more obscure works back, the scary stuff. Um, the best of it was reprinted in four volumes recently of short stories, and in in Weird Tales. And you know, 50 years later, I just think it's it's really interesting for us to read an author like him in 2022 and just figure out where he fits and how we can still identify with anything that he wrote about. Okay, and I want to show you a YouTube video. You want to see a YouTube video? This is, people are still, to this day, um, writing about and making movies about Cthulhu. Oh yeah. And what I want to show you 
is the trailer of a movie that came out, I think, in 2009. It's called The Last Lovecraft. And it's about a person who, it's a comedy, it's hilarious, who discovers that he is the last descendant of H.P. Lovecraft. And there is still a cult worshiping Cthulhu out there, and they're trying to kill him. Okay, so let's, let's just look at the trailer. I might have to turn my mic off for this. I don't know. We'll see. There is no volume. Anybody? Do I need to turn my mic off? No. Oh, this is off again. That's all. Okay, got it. Is it going to work now? There we go. He's ready to return. And the only ones who can stop it. No man shall prevent the second coming of the great old one. Are these guys. Squirrely squirrel gift baskets. This is Jeff. May I take your order? At the end of a great bloodline. I was wondering if you wanted to come to my place this weekend. Actually, uh, me and Charlie were working on this whole comic book thing. The last living relative of Lovecraft himself. I don't know what you're supposed to say the world really. I look like a hobbit to you, brother. You're the two guys who came to the master's house for help. What, the master of your grandma's guest room? You're wearing a Cthulhu mask. Yeah. The one you promised not to open without me. You wouldn't dare. Oh, wouldn't I dare? Then why is my hand moving slowly towards your face? I don't know, but you're not daring. It's a third black hole. For one ball. I'm going on an adventure with my friends. It's an adventure full of glory and danger. This is my sex face. Please, Please don't, don't say what you always say when my friends come over, that I'm fat and retarded. But that's how you roll. Come on! You boys ever been fish raped? It's something you're not likely to forget. That relic is reassembled. All hell is going to break loose. I do have a weapon stash not far from here. Give him a real fight. I'm like a ninja. Damn you, you fish worshiping freaks! It's time. We got company. To take. Ah, oh, second save in the world. A stand. We're gonna die. The last Lovecraft. I got the relic! Oh, what are you doing? Exercise or something like your cardio. I'll never be your dungeon master again. My favorite part of this trailer is if I can find it. Is uh, I don't know what you're supposed to say the world really. They're practicing like fighting against Cthulhu. I don't see it right here, just scrolling through. But he has a bunch of those Oh here it is. It's this it's this part. He's got a bunch of the pool noodles as tentacles, so that he's pretending to be Cthulhu with his mask on and they're practice fighting together. It's just funny using pool noodles as, 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 as scary tentacles, regardless. Okay, now, let's say, hypothetical situation, you wanna read this stuff, cause you do. Where are you gonna find it? My office? Where's that? Here you go. Probably stuff online. Um, there are a couple websites. Um, the most uh, Project Gutenberg is probably one of the better sites. Um, there's also one called the Internet Archive where you might find them. All free. You got this library thing? Yeah. Use the library, don't you? Don't forget about public libraries. They're fantastic things. Okay, so um, so, are, so if you're comfortable reading this stuff on your phone, on a Kindle, on a laptop, go with it. I don't like that personally. I'm old school, I suppose. I like the books, the, the physical books. Lie on the couch, cat on my lap, all that stuff, you know. Very important. Very, very important. Now ask me why I still like Love, why, why I like Lovecraft, why I like Durlith. That is an amazing question. Okay. I like them because in their stories and the novels and so on, there is a lack of structure in our lives, 
Okay, so think, think about this. All this time that we have, and so much of it is dictated by other people. Other people telling us what we have to do with our time. Imagine a world where time does not exist in the same way and that other people don't tell you how to use it simply because it doesn't exist. What would you do? Okay, where are you here at three o'clock today? Because Carrie here said this is gonna be at three o'clock on Monday today, so you're here, right? <laughs> I heard about that. <laughs> I did hear about that. Hmm. Just pick, imagine it. Time doesn't exist the way we know it here. What would you do? Yeah, maybe. I'm thinking of all of my students who work 40 plus hour week jobs. Quite a few of them do. They have to use that time because a manager schedules them for that time and they have no choice in order to keep their job, right? Lovecraft and Duralith, they don't, they don't play like that, not at all. What would you do? Any thoughts? Go to the internet. Really? You'd stay on the internet? Eek. I guess there's some good stuff on there too. Okay, and I think it's hard for us to imagine what we would do because we just can't fathom it, right? I, th I, think, I think that's part of the issue. But that's why I like reading them from, and it, it's, it's for that reason. Just, you know, the way the world is structured now and the stories that structure just doesn't exist. There might be some, you know, madness and insanity, small price to pay for a little bit of insanity, right? <laughs> Timelessness. What questions do you have about Duralith that I will try to answer? I don't know at all. Okay, I'll well, I'll, I can use the microphone here too so everyone can hear. So who has questions? Okay. It's not necessarily about Duralith, it's about you. Uh-oh. Do you write and what? I do write. I write memoirs. I just had one published in a magazine called Cutbow Quarterly, the very first issue. In fact, I can pull it up on the internet for you right now. Because it's cool. You want to see? Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to I'm gonna pat myself on the back for this one. Because it's not a traditional memoir. Very first issue, and they picked mine. Right? Um, do you want to read my stuff? You'll have to find it. Okay, and if I... It's on page 26. I do remember that. <laughs> the rest of this issue is, is insignificant. Um, it's <laughs> they, were, um, they put out a call for pieces that were not told in traditional form. They're called hybrid pieces. So it's, um, I put mine in the shape of a crossword puzzle. Um, if internet would go a little bit faster here. Um, well, that's pulling up though. Any other questions though? About Durlith or not? Oh, lots. Okay, I'm making my way over. Okay, here hmm. I saw Maybe this not. Let's see. hand first. Did you have a hand? Yeah. Yes. How come you've never been to Sauk Prairie? Why have I never been to Sauk Prairie? Yes. Is there anything above Madison? <laughs> is there anything? Is it is? There's the whole Driftless area. Driftless. The most beautiful part of the state. I don't do outdoorsy things. Just just stay in your car and drive. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> That's why. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Other questions about the author or the presenter? Okay, I'm making my way here. How, how are they consistent with Asimov as writers? Oh, Asimov came later. He did. Um, wow. <laughs> what do you know by Asimov? Oh gosh, I have, you know what, I have to think about that one. I've, I've tried to struggle trying to figure out where Lovecraft fits in. What were the years that they were both? Lovecraft was the 20s yeah. and into the 30s. Okay. Asimov, gosh, I don't know. So he came later. Yeah, like more science fiction. So Asimov, he, did he write the Martian Chronicles? Yeah. And so on? I guess Asimov stuff took mostly took 
took place mostly in space then, didn't it? Does that sound right? Okay. And it wasn't quite a warped imagination like Lovecraft and Durlith were toying with, yeah. right? More social issues, I think, in Asimov. My father was a, a traveling salesman, and he had, he had Lovecraft, and then he had, eventually he had all of Asimov. Mm -hmm. That's okay. I'm, I'm extremely curious okay. having a, a, a kid who mm -hmm. reads this stuff, including Lovecraft now. Oh. And I was trying to figure out what the blanking history is of this weird science fiction. Yeah, story. the weird, con I mean, the weird continues. Weird Tales is still out there, the magazine. Yeah. So it's still it's still being published. I don't think Asimov. I think it was weird, though. Yeah, I mean, and then with the, right, and then with the sixties with Asimov. I mean, you know, completely different See, spirit of the age. From 20 to, uh, 50, okay. How bad? Can I have them? Yeah. <laughs> That's okay. Can I have them still? I think there was another question in this Take row, wasn't there? Take good care of them, I swear. Wait, was it you that had the question? Okay. I was going to, did he actually make a living from this? Did oh, yeah. Have a pot? Okay, mm -hmm. so he could stop, he stopped teaching. Mm -hmm. Ah. Well, he, <clears throat> he did both at the same time. Oh. Like a lot of writers do. Yeah. yeah. Like, I made a lot of money from this. Ask me how much. Uh -huh. Nothing. <laughs> Not a thing. This is, this is, to give you the story, so what I did was, um, it's, call, it's called Solving Robert, because it's a memoir of when I went to London a while ago, and um, the friend of mine lived there with his brother, Robert and Gerald. Um, Gerald's my friend, Robert's his brother, and while I was there, Robert had a complete psych, um, psychotic meltdown, and we had to have him um, institutionalized. While I was on vacation there, okay, so I thought, and all he kept complaining about was how bored he was, and that's why I have, I've called it Solving Robert, I hope you found something to do. And then the memoir goes here, if I can make it bigger, so here, um, progressively chronologically through what happened, and then at the very end, just a crossword puzzle clue that connects to the paragraph that I just wrote. I'll let you look at it. Um, but either way, um, I wrote it as a straight memoir. It just didn't, didn't resonate for me. Um, so I decided to see what would happen if I made it into a crossword puzzle as if I were solving a person and, and, um, and did that with it. Um, I like this catty old lady here in Gatwick Airport because I didn't know how to call a number at the pay phone. She's like, you just put a coin in and, and dial. It's just a phone. Like, like thanks, you know, but <laughs> made me mad. So things like that. Was there a question on this side? Okay. Uh, would you care to comment on uh, uh, Durla's famous work, Walden West? Uh, and I find it very interesting that being that he was a naturalist, the transition from that type of writing into, into the, uh, the fantasy uh, side of things. Walden West for me was a required reading when I was uh, in high school. Mm -hmm. And my uh, English teacher was actually personal friends with Oh yeah, Durlis. okay. And, and I remember uh, his, uh, the professor's name was uh, Dwayne Walker. Mm -hmm. and he would make trips to see uh, Durleth. Uh, on weekends and whatever, and he would come back and he was like enlightened, you know. I never right. met Durleth personally, but uh, uh, I was kind of there. I'm guessing Walden inspired by Thoreau. Yes. Right. Um, here you go. <clears throat> I hadn't heard of August Durleth till I moved to Wisconsin. Because down south we don't get, we didn't get no Durleth down, down there in public school. Um, 
So I still have a lot of Durlith reading to do. I knew Lovecraft, though. Okay. And um, when I moved to Wisconsin, it, when we were the UW colleges, the two-year system, they had a writing award every year called the Durlith Prize. So I looked into who this Durlith person was, who I'd never heard of, and um, then I discovered he knew Lovecraft, so that's how I got interested. Um, as far as the saga goes, I've not delved into that so much, um, because that, that style of writing doesn't interest me too much, but the, but the weird stuff did. Um, I was I was asked. Um, I, a small snippet went into the campus newsletter today. Um, asked me when I first read Lovecraft and Durlith and so on. And I first I discovered Lovecraft when I was in junior high. And his uh, I fr and I can't remember how I discovered him, but I, I remember not liking him too much because it was so descriptive. And I'm 12. You know, I want a plot. I want something fast, and it wasn't. So I had I picked him up again later, and then and then appreciated him, and that's how I grew to appreciate Durlith. You know, even after the fact. Um, but the regionalist writing, I'm not f very familiar with it at all. In fact, and I guess it's a it's a black mark on me. So. <laughs> so I'm gonna get there. It can be. It can be. I mean, you know, 18 years in Wisconsin. I don't know if I consider myself a Wisconsinite yet, but. I do, uh, do I talk better? Okay. I, I don't like brats. I understand that's a requirement. Cheese curds, yes. Brats, no. It's that weird crunch. And then, yes. Yeah, oh, gosh. Okay. Tallahassee. I'll eat grits. I'll eat greens. Oh, no. No okra. No. That's too slimy. But, yeah. Yeah, Other biscuits and gravy, all that, yeah. Black eyed peas. Oh, yeah, black eyed peas, definitely. Other questions? I'll need more of that up For here. John or about John? For about, <laughs> comments toward me. <laughs> yeah. Let me cross this here. Could you tell me if the grandchildren of April are still in Wisconsin? As far as I know. Okay. That's all I know, is as far as I know. I need to look into the state of it, yeah. Thank you. How easy is it to get the original work? Original? The Wisconsin Historical Society has a bunch of stuff there. Um, most likely under lock and key, but I'll bet you can still look at it. I look, try to find you can. Yeah, you might have to actually very, very go there. Expensive. Oh, oh, yeah, oh, definitely to own it. Oh, yeah, 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 um, but still accessible. Yeah. You're making me walk all the way up to the other end. I mean, I've I've started actually um, <laughs> downsizing my book collection at home because I just thought part of it is I don't want to deal with them anymore, and another part is there could be other people enjoying these things, and they're, otherwise they're just sitting on a shelf, you know? Yeah. Are you going to delve into any other Wisconsin authors? I have delved. Um, did you see my presentation last year? Does it ring a bell on forgotten Wisconsin authors? Um, so I talked about uh, Zona Gale was one. Who else did I talk about? You remember? The you know, the ones that nobody remembers. Like I'm forgetting them yeah. now. Well, we do have a vi we have a video of that lecture on our website. Yes, that's right. So okay. Yes, I think it was three. Three. It was people. three. But oh, current Wisconsin authors. As, oh, somebody challenged me last year, and I've not done very much on it, forgive me, to find forgotten writers from this area. And I would like to still do that. Um, so I'm, I'm well connected at the Rock County Historical Society, and I'm trying to get more into the, the Whitewater Historical Society. I understand, what's the name of the Whitewater newspaper? Register. Register, that it's all digitized now even way, way, way back. And a lot of the writings might be in the newspaper, some you know, short stories, poetry, things like that when newspapers publish those. So I might be able to uncover some stuff that way. I would also recommend our very last lecture of this series is Jennifer Motzko, who is the UW-Whitewater campus archivist. And so she has a lot of the archives, not only from UW-Whitewater, but from the city of Whitewater, Jefferson County, all that kind of stuff. She's absolutely fantastic, and she'll be here at the end of the series, but she'll help you. I might have to come to that, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I accepted the challenge, but I haven't followed through with the challenge yet, but, <laughs> but it's on my list. 
any other questions? Otherwise, John, I'll stick around for a few minutes if anybody right, wants yeah. to ask him questions individually. A, a schedule of our whole series is in the back if you don't have it. Um, go ahead and take that. And we have a couple other talks in town here too coming up in the next couple of months. Um, but I hope to see you here next week. We're gonna talk about Hmong people in Wisconsin. Um, but for now, join me in thanking uh, Dr. John Pruitt for his talk today. Thanks everybody. I wish my actual students were as attentive and interested and asked just as amazing questions. I'm giving them a hard time in their absence right now. <laughs>